and the work just from reading my pages. And it's, it's quite a small part of the book. So if you already know the authors, I hope it's an additional pleasure. And if you don't, I hope it's not annoying. <laughs> my highest ambition as a writer. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, Sean, the graduate student, Abigail, his actor's girlfriend, and Dara live in the house on Fortune Street. It's owned by Abigail, who very unexpectedly, in a rather Victorian way, inherits some money from an aunt she didn't even really know she, know she had, and she buys the house on Fortune Street. Um, the fourth character is a member of another generation. The fourth character is Dara's father, Cameron. And I'm just going to read a, a, a page, really, from his, from his section. The epigraph, I always stumble over that word, the epigraph for um, Cameron's uh, section uh, comes from uh, Charles Dodgson, perhaps better known as Lewis Carroll, the author of, most famously, Alice in Wonderland, but also a number of other wonderful <coughs> children's books. Um, Dodgson was, uh, even by English standards of eccentricity, which I think are quite flexible, um, <laughs> a quite eccentric person. He was, he was either one of 11 children or he had 11 siblings. I've forgotten which now. And even as a small boy, busily invented stories and um, uh, plays to entertain his siblings. He uh, built a, a model railway in um, the garden of the vicarage. His father was a vicar. And at the age of about 14, he's reputed to have written an opera based on railway timetables. <laughs> <laughs> I can't quite picture this myself. He went up to Oxford at the age of 16, as people often did those day, in those days, to study mathematics and remained there for the rest of his life as a don of mathematics. And um, was also a very ardent amateur photographer at a time when photography was a very complicated um, undertaking. You used plates of glass and they were covered in a solution that had to be wet when you took the photograph. So it was, it was quite a tricky undertaking. Anyway, to get back to the point, <laughs> um, when Charles Dodgson had a particularly pleasant day, which for him was often a day on which he had been for a picnic with Alice Liddell, for whom he wrote Alice in Wonderland and her sisters. Um, he would write in his diaries this sentence, I mark this day with a white stone. I thought this was just a beautiful phrase. So that is the title of Cameron's section. And I'm just going to read a, a little bit. Um, it's, this is set in rural Scotland in the 1960s, a subject upon which I consider myself something of an expert. <laughs> I, I mark this day with a white stone. I always intended to live as an upright man. I remember when I was 17 telling my friend Davy that I thought it was wrong to eat anything I couldn't kill myself. I don't mean that I have to kill everything I eat, I explained, but I want to be sure that I can. We were taking a break from doing our homework leaning on the gate of one of his father's fields, smoking. It was our new illicit hobby. Between us, when we put our minds to it, we managed to get through a pack a week. Davy had been to the barber that morning, and when he turned to look at me, all his features, his light blue eyes, his full red lips, seemed larger and more naked. With your bare hands, Cameron, he asked mockingly. I knew it was just an expression, the bear emphasizing the extremity of whatever the hands were doing, but I glanced down at my own hands, rather small for a boy of my age, with my father's short, flexible thumbs, and I couldn't imagine them clutching the neck of an animal or bringing a hammer down on a skull. Of course not, I said, with a gun. I'd never held a gun of any kind other than a toy pistol, but I'd seen enough films that I could picture myself squinting down the barrel, squeezing the trigger. How about one of Dad's pigs, said Davy. If you kill it, I bet he'll let you have some of the bacon. 
or there are the hens, but they're so easy they don't count. Davy himself killed hens on a regular basis, chopping off their heads with a little axe that the rest of the time was used for kindling. Come on, he said, taking a last pull of his cigarette before flicking it into a puddle. Let's go and choose your dinner. I'm going to skip a, a, a brief passage where they discuss their Latin homework. Um, Davy led me to an adjacent field, where, and, and also Davy fetches, I should say Dave, rather importantly, Davy fetches his father's rifle from the farmhouse. Now Davy led me to an adjacent field where the pigs held sway. After the rain, it was even more of a quagmire than usual. How about Mabel, said Davy, pointing at a pig with a large, large black patch on one haunch. She killed three of her last litter by rolling over on them. I'm sure she's ready for the great sty in the sky. As Mabel rooted around searching for acorns, the poor pig's truffles, Davy called them, I made one last effort to explain myself. If I'm going to eat meat, I said, then it seems immoral to be squeamish about killing animals, but happy to benefit from someone else doing it. You eat carrots, said Davy, and you don't grow them. Come on. The breeze was quickening, and in the hedgerows, the birds, as if at some secret signal, had fallen silent. Davy was already heading down the road back to the house. I trailed a few steps behind. At the back door, he told me to wait. When he reappeared, he was carrying a rifle. Are you allowed to have that thing, I said. The only answer came from above as the rain started to fall. Davy was already striding across the farmyard. Once again, I followed, hands in pockets, head down, as if demonstrating my reluctance to him and to myself. I could never have admitted that somewhere deep inside, I was also excited, swept up by Davy's passion and wherever it was taking us. Back at the field, he balanced the rifle on the top rung of the metal gate and, just as I'd imagined, squinted down the barrel. Mabel had moved closer. Fifty feet, Davy said. A tricky shot for a novice, but it's easier to aim when you have support. No, I said. Davy lifted the rifle off the gate and held it out to me. I backed away. Do you want people to think you're a coward, he said looking me square in the face. What people, I said. There's only you and the pigs. Still looking at me, still holding out the gun, Davy took a step towards me. Besides, I added, I'm not. Davy took another step. In the rain, his hair had turned almost black and his eyes had a flat, bright look. Come on, he whispered his face so close that I felt rather than heard his words. People sometimes claim that at moments of crisis, everything was a blur, or alternatively, crystal clear. For me, that afternoon in the pig field was both. Davy's eyes never left mine, the gun pressed against my chest, the pigs grunted and scuffled. I took the gun and I imitated Davy. I rested the barrel on the gate, peered along it until it seemed to be pointing roughly in the direction of Mabel's patchwork rump, and pulled the trigger. I had no intention of hurting her. This was all about Davy and me and a certain heat between us. The gun kicked, my head filled with noise, and the sharp smell made my nostrils prickle. Mabel screamed and the other pigs plunged into confusion. Damn, said Davy. What have you done? Um, I read an early version of this section at a conference I was at in, uh, in Tennessee. And afterwards, I could barely get away from the podium as people rushed towards me to tell me how you should really kill a pig. <laughs> <laughs> Almost everyone, every male in the audience, claimed to have owned a gun since the age of six. And they had a great deal to tell me. So I owe a debt to my southern friends for helping out. 
And I have to say, northern audiences have been singularly unhelpful. <laughs> it's an interesting con geographical contrast. I'm going to read, um, I think, as you can see, I begin with sections by the two men in the novel. The last two sections are, are from the point of view of da first Dara and then Abigail. And I'm just going to read you um, a couple of pages from Dara's section. It's called The Feast of Epiphany, um, which is not a literary reference um, so much as a date that is very important to Dara. And we're now back in contemporary times. Dara is staying with Sean and Abigail in the country. They've borrowed a house for, from some friends for the weekend. She gets up early in the morning and goes for a walk along the towpath by the canal. And she's a keen amateur artist, and she takes her sketchbook with her. And when she finds a style, she sits down on the style to draw the scene. Now Dara, now Dara drew the willow tree on the far side of the canal with its long flowing branches. She added a narrow boat, the ducks, and in the distance, a church spire. She was shading the spire when she heard a soft, tearing sound. Two cows, one black and white, one brown, had approached and were grazing nearby. Hello, said Dara, but neither raised its head all those stomachs to feed. Turning back to the canal, Dara was just in time to see a large black dog, like something out of a fairy tale, bounding along the towpath. It passed her without a glance. As the dog disappeared, she heard pounding footsteps. Someone in pursuit? No, the man who came into view, wearing dark shorts and a white t-shirt, was just running. From the style, Dara had an excellent view of his approach, arms and legs pumping steadily. And then, quite suddenly, he was sprawled on the ground at her feet. She jumped down to help. Are you all right? What the hell? He struggled into a sitting position, his shirt grazed with dirt. Where did you come from? I was sitting on the style. I didn't mean to startle you. You didn't. I must have caught my foot on a root or a stone. That's the trouble with running in the country. You never know what you'll find. He uttered this last remark as if, Dara thought, rural irritations might include her. Is your leg all right, she said. Let me help you up. On the second attempt, leaning heavily on her, swearing, he managed to stand and hobble to the stile. As he sat on the bottom stair, the black dog reappeared, still running at top speed. Before it could reach them, the man called out, Boris, sit, and it dropped to its haunches. Tongue lolling, the man, the dog, watched the man alertly. So did Dara, as he bent forward to probe his ankle and flex his foot. His dark hair, which from a distance had looked short, turned out to be tied back in a ponytail. His well-muscled legs and arms were covered with fine dark hair, though not, Dara thought, too much. Are you all right? she repeated. Fine, he said brusquely. But when he pushed himself up off the stile, he gasped and swayed. Involuntarily, she moved towards him. For the first time, his eyes, they were almost the same shade as the chestnuts that filled her pocket, registered her presence. Sorry, he said, I'm staying a few hundred yards away. Do you have time to give me a hand? With Boris trotting ahead, the man, he was six inches taller than Dara, leaning on her shoulder, they made their way slowly down the towpath. It's going to be a nice day when the mist burns off, said Dara. After four steps, he said, yes. I'm never normally up this early, she tried again. I'm visiting some friends who borrowed a house and the quiet woke me. After six more lurching steps, he said, it can do that. No more, thought Dara. But as they continued their unsteady progress, 
the silence began to feel companionable rather than adversarial.